In this video, we will learn what it means for a sample to be pure, and how to use purity to describe a sample that is impure. We'll also learn how to calculate the purity of a substance based on its proportion by mass, and we'll also look at how impurities impact melting and boiling points. Firstly, what does pure mean? In everyday life, you might see it used to describe someone who is very moral. Or you may see it on packaging in the supermarket, like 100% pure beef mince. In everyday life, pure means all of this and nothing else. So pure beef is beef and only beef. But chemists use the word pure to mean something more specific. Beef is made up of proteins, fats, water, and many other substances. It's still pure beef, but it's not a pure substance because it's made of many different substances. So to a chemist, a sample is a pure chemical if it contains only one substance. There's nothing wrong with calling beef pure beef, but if you've got your chemist hat on, you need to be thinking of the chemical version of purity. To a chemist, a sample is either perfectly pure or not. If a sample is not pure, we say that it is impure. But that's very black and white. The slightest impurity will make a sample impure, so we can talk in more detail. We can think of purity as lying on a spectrum between completely impure and completely pure. If we have a sample that's 99% the chemical we want, that's usually close enough. A sample might be significantly less pure than this, so we can imagine a range which we measure in percentage points. A pure sample is 100% pure. And we could imagine a sample that doesn't contain any of the chemical we want to be 0% pure, although we wouldn't use that language very often. Once we get about the 95%, you might hear chemicals described as nearly pure, because for many applications, that's good enough. Making a relatively pure chemical is sometimes not that expensive. But making chemicals really pure can be much, much more expensive. Sometimes low purity products are okay for certain applications like cleaning. But for some applications, even the smallest amount of impurity can make a sample completely useless. For example, if we had medicine that was only 99% pure and we didn't know what the other 1% was, it might not be safe to take the medicine. Typically in the lab, we'll use chemicals that are in between these two extremes of purity. Of course, we don't need to only talk about one chemical when discussing the purity of a sample we could talk about the purity for all the chemicals in a sample. So a mixture of chemical X and chemical Y will be somewhere in between 100% X and 100% Y. It could be 50% of one or 50% of the other or anything in between. But what do these percentages actually relate to? When talking about percentage purity, you could talk about a number of things, like the mass, the volume, or the amount in moles. But the most common we use is mass. So we calculate percentage purity by taking the mass due to the chemical we're interested in, dividing by the total mass of the sample, and multiplying by 100%. Here's an example where the mass of the sample is 10 grams. We have 8 grams of our target chemical, and two grams of our impurities. We can calculate the percentage purity by taking the mass of the chemical we're interested in, dividing by the total mass of the sample, and multiplying by 100%, giving us a purity of our target chemical of 80% in this sample. When we're dealing with purity in this way, you may see the symbol W slash W, which stands for weight of chemical per weight of sample. We've looked at percentage purity, but we haven't really examined what it means to be an impurity. If pure fun is the hour you spend playing laser tag, the impurity is the 20 minutes it takes to get there. What we call an impurity depends on the situation. Imagine you're in the kitchen and you're doing some baking and you want to use sugar or salt. Now imagine sprinkling a little bit of salt onto a pile of sugar and a little bit of sugar onto a pile of salt. 
If you want pure sugar, but there's also a little salt there, the salt is the impurity. But if you want pure salt, and there's a little sugar, the sugar is the impurity. Quite often, impurities are quite similar to the chemical we want. For instance, in powdered calcium carbonate, there might be a little calcium oxide. Both of these are ionic compounds that contain calcium and oxygen. And impurities could also have nothing to do with the chemical. When we have sugar and salt, we have two very different chemicals. One is an organic compound with covalent bonds between carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And the other is an inorganic compound with bonds between sodium ions and chloride ions. Impurities can be harmful, so you could have corrosive sodium hydroxide mixed in with salt. Or, like a little salt in some sugar, they can be harmless. Although perhaps a baker would disagree. Ultimately, it comes down to the situation you're in and the nature of the impurity. So far, we've looked at describing purity and impurities, but how do we go about testing purity? Fine table salt is a white powder. Fine sugar can look very similar. Imagine that you have a really fine mixture of the two, and imagine you don't know how much is sugar and how much is salt. For solids that are very, very different chemically, like table salt and sugar, it's quite a tough job to do. But something interesting happens if chemicals are similar enough, like a mixture of table sugar and glucose, which is a molecule that can be made from sugar. There's a simple observation that's very reliable with mixtures like these that you can use to tell if something is close to pure in one direction or the other. The melting point of sugar is 186 degrees Celsius. Generally, with a pure chemical substance, there will be a very precise melting point. Below that melting point, it will be solid, and above that melting point, it will be liquid. But for a sample that's mostly the chemical with a little impurity, the melting point will be quite broad and will be lower than the pure value. This is what we might see for a sample that's 99% sugar. Perhaps below 184 degrees Celsius, it's a solid. And above 185 degrees Celsius, it will be a liquid. In between, we'll see a mixture of solid and liquid, no matter how long we heat at that temperature. These numbers have been made up for slightly impure sugar. We can't be sure exactly what the melting point of 99% sugar would be, because it can depend on the impurity. But for something that's mostly pure, we can be sure of a broad melting point that's lower than the standard value. Here, we've looked at sugar and slightly impure sugar. But we could have looked at glucose and we'd see the same effect, the melting point of an impure mixture being slightly lower than the melting point of pure glucose. All this means that we have a simple test. If we have a sample, we think it's pure, its melting point should be exactly that of the pure chemical. So if we test the melting point of the sample we think is pure sugar, if it's 186 degrees Celsius and it's a very sharp melting point, then we're probably dealing with pure sugar. If, however, the melting point is below 186 degrees Celsius and it's quite broad, then we're probably dealing with impure sugar and we'll need to do other tests to determine what the impurities are. But so far, we've been looking at mixtures of solids. What about mixtures of liquids? For pure liquids, the boiling point will be a very precise, repeatable value. Like for water, it's 100 degrees Celsius. If we add some sodium chloride to table salt, we may see the boiling point rise as high as 104 degrees Celsius. But bear in mind, there are some exceptions where adding something to water will decrease its boiling point rather than increase it. But generally speaking, when looking at impure samples, we expect a broad melting point, lower than the pure value, and a higher boiling point. The last thing we're going to look at is how you adjust if you know that your sample is impure. In fact, for most of human history, we've rarely had samples we would call pure chemicals today. Water from the ocean has lots of different impurities. Even rainwater has dust from the atmosphere and dissolved gases in it. 
Metals or their ores from the ground are hard to purify, and the technology to make them pure substances has only existed for the last few hundred years. Chemistry has been happening quite happily without pure chemicals. This is because, in many cases, impurities don't interfere with the reaction in question. But if you want to produce rainwater, or you want to make a really pure metal for a certain application, there are some things you can do. There are many, many forms of purification, but all of them help to remove impurities, leaving a more pure sample behind. Filtration, crystallization, and distillation are just some examples appropriate to different use cases. The alternative is simply to use more of the sample. Let's say, for instance, you need exactly one gram of sodium bicarbonate for a reaction. But you only have 95% pure bicarbonate of soda, and the rest is perhaps something unimportant, like sodium chloride. All we need to do is make an adjustment. We know it's 95% pure, so all we need to do is add a little bit more so that the total mass of bicarbonate is one gram. In this case, we'd need to add about 1.05 grams of our 95% pure sodium bicarbonate to have one gram of sodium bicarbonate in there. This is just the principle. We won't be going into the mathematics of this in this video. Instead, it's time for some practice. The image below shows a labeled bottle of orange juice. Why might the company claim the orange juice is 100% pure? Here's our bottle. Here's the label, and here we can see stamped on the bottle the claim the orange juice is 100% pure. In everyday language, when we see the word pure, it generally means that we're dealing with that thing and nothing else. So this is orange juice and nothing but orange juice. This means there's no apple juice, no blackberry juice. And no bananas, so all the juice in the bottle came from oranges. Something else we might expect when we see the word "pure" on food or drink is that nothing's been added. This means sugars and artificial sweeteners and so forth haven't been introduced. The exception we might make for orange juice is that water's been added. Therefore, a company might claim the orange juice is 100% pure because it contains no added or artificial products. Why might a chemist say that the orange juice is not pure? To a chemist, the word "pure" has a slightly more specific meaning. We use "pure" when referring to a sample that contains only one chemical substance. The substances inside orange juice include water, different types of acid, sugars, and depending on the type, there may be more or less fiber from the pulp. But this is only a short list of the many, many substances you might find in orange juice. All these substances are different chemicals, so orange juice is not a pure chemical. So a chemist might say that the orange juice is not pure because it does not contain just one substance. Next, let's have a go at calculating percentage purity. An impure sample of magnesium chloride has a mass of 50 grams. After perfect purification, 45 grams of magnesium chloride is recovered. What is the percentage purity of the original sample? Magnesium chloride is a salt with formula MgCl2, and we're told we have a sample containing magnesium chloride with a mass of 50 grams, but it's impure. Some of the sample is magnesium chloride, but some of the sample is not. Next, we're told this sample has undergone perfect purification. When we perform a purification, our aim is to remove impurities. In a perfect purification, we're removing all the impurities and not losing any of our target chemical. In this case, what we're getting out is 45 grams of 100% pure magnesium chloride. The question is asking us what is the percentage purity of the starting sample. So, just to recap, we have our starting sample, which weighed 50 grams. It was then purified, removing the impurities, leaving 45 grams of magnesium chloride. So we must have removed 5 grams of impurities because we can't gain or lose mass in cases like this. 
we know there were 5 grams of impurities because 50 grams minus 45 grams is 5 grams. Now, the question isn't after the mass of impurities. It's after the percentage purity of the original sample. And we calculate the percentage purity by taking the mass of the chemical in the sample, divide by the total mass of the sample, and multiply the result by 100%. The mass of chemical is the mass of magnesium chloride recovered. And the mass of the original sample was 50 grams. We can then multiply that by 100%. This gets us 0 0.9 times 100%, which is 90%. So the mass of the original sample that was due to magnesium chloride is 90%. Next, let's look back at the key points. In chemistry, when we use pure to describe a sample, we mean it's made of only one chemical substance, and we might call that sample 100% pure. We often describe purity using percentage purity, which gives us the percentage of the mass of the sample that's due to the particular chemical. We calculate this by taking the mass of chemical in the sample, divide it by the total mass of the sample, and multiply the result by 100%. An impurity is simply any other substance that isn't the desired one. If we introduce impurities into a pure sample, we'll lower the melting point. Doing this will also broaden the distance between the temperature at which we have 100% liquid and the temperature at which we have 100% solid. And generally speaking, if we introduce an impurity to water, we'll raise the boiling point of the water. And this occurs with other liquids too.